Cricket Love Stories with me, Neil Kagram. Today we're joined by Stuart McGill. Stuart, coming up to 2 a.m. your time. Late one for you. Yeah. How are you keeping? Look, uh, Neil, it, 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 uh, it might seem as though it's late for me, but uh, life post-cricket um, has found me in hospitality. So um, uh, my wife and I have a restaurant. Um, and you know what? We work pretty hard and pretty late sometimes. And because I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a chef uh, and I can't really do much, particularly in this current environment, there's no customers to speak of sitting in a restaurant, so I can't talk to anyone apart from you. Uh, so I just sit here all night polishing glasses and sweeping the floor. <laughs> and and having a glass of wine while I'm, you know, discussing all wine. things important. <laughs> You've got to unwind. You've got to unwind. Um, so let's take it all the way back for yourself. So born in Perth, your father and yes. grandfather both played for Western Australia. So was it always inevitable that um, you make a career out of cricket? You know what made um, lots of lots of kids. Um, feel pressure from their families. Um, doesn't matter whether it's sport or, you know, doctor, dentist, um, you know, fireman. Uh, lots of people feel pressure from their parents to do the same thing. Um, I never, I never felt that pressure, but I always knew that cricket was a part of my life. I, um, my, my, my father, um, I, he played first grade cricket in Perth for, you know, possibly even 30 years. And I used to go to every single game and sit in the changing rooms, even before I knew what the guys were talking about. Um, and and uh, then I was playing on the sidelines and I was watching them and cricket was most definitely in my blood. I just didn't know at the time that it was unusual for a you know, little boy growing up in Perth to have a father and a grandfather who had played first class cricket. And, and you know, further to that, my dad's best mate when I was growing up was Dennis Lilly. And I just thought that was normal. So <laughs> yeah, is it every dad's best mate, Dennis Lilly? <laughs> yeah. So, um, in terms of your first club site, uh, what were they called? And when did you actually first um, take to the art of leg spin? So um, my grandfather um, opened the batting and bowling for Western Australia um, just after the, the, the Second World War. Um, my father was a leg spin bowler. And... As I mentioned before, much like a lot of kids, I wanted to do what my dad did. And so I remember I must have been about six or seven years old and I was bowling in the front garden with my best mate at the time, Michael Simpson. And his dad said to me, said, oh, that, that was a natural googly. And I, I didn't even know. Look, you know, he might have just been being nice to me. I didn't even know what that was, but I thought at that time that, okay, so if that's a googly and I bowled one, maybe I should be a spin bowler. Because um, I always wanted to be uh, Dennis. I wanted to be the scary, nasty, fast bowler. But when Michael's dad said, that's a googly, how did you bowl that? I thought, well, maybe I can be as good as my father. And that's when I started bowling uh, uh, wrist spin. I, I continued to bowl a little bit of both until I was about maybe 12. And then I realised I was too short and too slow. <laughs> so spin bowling was the business. So when did your talents first get recognised? Did you must have played for like a junior club side? Before you got, well, um, did you come to the Western uh, Western Australian Academy as well? Yeah, it, it, it's quite it, it's quite interesting actually, uh, particularly talking to 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 you Neil from from the UK. Um, the <laughs> you're going to be shocked at the age when I started to 
really sort of kick on, I guess. Um, I had to play at school and I played through school. I wasn't in the first 11 at school. I wasn't good enough to get into the first 11. Um, actually had a period of time when between 16 and 17 when I couldn't bowl a, a leg break. The only thing I could bowl was uh, Rollins. Um, I, I could not bowl a leg break. Um, and uh, so that affected school cricket. But when I left school, I went to a club called North Perth, which was my father's club, and it just started to click. And all I was trying to do was turn the ball as big as I could. Um, I didn't anticipate things moving as quickly as they did. But between the ages of 18 and 20, let's say, they did really kick on. And I got picked in the um, um, AIS, the Cricket Academy, um, in 1991. Long time ago, I know. Apologies. I hope you were born then. Uh, but but um, after that, things kind of stalled a little bit. So I was 20 in 91. I played one game for Western Australia in around about 93, let's say. 12th man. Yeah. Yeah. 12th uh, man a couple of times, uh, maybe six times. But then I thought at 25 years old, I'd, and I, I hesitate to say wasted, but I felt that I'd spend a lot of time on cricket without having actually got anywhere. And we, at that time, were predominantly amateur in Australia. Um, you would get paid if you played, but you didn't get paid to train. Uh, I was in the state squad, state senior squad in Western Australia for five years, but we, did, we got nothing. So I thought, you know what? I'm either going to play cricket or I'm not going to play cricket, and it's time to find out. Because 25 years old, I'm starting to be past it. And that's the bit that surprises a lot of people from the UK. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, if you're not, in a, if you're not a, <laughs> on the list at 18, you, you're finished. I moved, I caught the train from Perth to Sydney, took three days. So that's how big Australia is. <laughs> so three days to catch the train, moved from Perth to Sydney. The first year I played here, my club won the grade premiership, which was a great experience. And the next year I played for New South Wales, which is 1996, and I was 26 years old. So, so do you think that you'd the, imagine, it, that's yeah. ridiculous from an English point of view. So do you think also in terms of your development as a spinner, Sydney, uh, the pitch itself is known for uh, being, you know, spin friendly and the whacker um, was always known to be one that uh, suited fast bowling. I know leg spin bowlers always say they do like a bit of bounce as well, but do you think that kind yeah. of, did that, um, was that a factor in your decision making as well? So, no. So uh, both Warney and I agree uh, on this. Um, and uh, you, you mentioned it, a, a little bit of pace in the pitch is great. Bounce, pace, fantastic. Because when you rely on deceiving somebody through the air, if you do deceive them, you want to be sure that the pitch is fast enough so that they can't adjust. Um, so... Actually, my favourite pitch in Australia to bowl on in a test match was the Gabba, which is similar to the Wacker. But the big, the big deal when you're trying to make, make it big is how much bowling you get. Yeah. And in Perth, even though I'd been taking more wickets as a spin bowler than anybody else in grade cricket, at you know, you, my maximum contribution on any given day, if I were to be picked at the WACA, would be probably 
10 overs, let's say 10, 12 overs. Whereas when I moved to Sydney, because it's really, it's not so much that it's better for spin bowling, it's really not good for fast bowlers. <laughs> like, it's pretty unforgiving. It gets slower and lower and the ball gets chopped up and nasty like a dog's play thing. Yeah. And, but that meant that I had the opportunity to bowl half the overs. And in my opinion, you bowl half the overs, you get a chance of getting half the wickets. And if you get half the wickets, then you've got a chance of being picked for the next level. You made your debut for Australia uh, 1998, uh, yes. the third test match um, against South Africa at home. Can you just now explain to the viewers what the baggy green actually means to an Australian? What it symbolises? So th there are a lot of opinions about the baggy green. Um, you know, some people, uh, you know, Warney, Warney, Mark Wolf, it, 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 lots of people like to wear uh, a wide-brimmed hat. I had always, even for my club sides, I'd always loved wearing the colours, you know. Uh, nowhere near as tough, but it's almost like having the patch from a bikey gang, you know what I mean? Like, a, I wanted to wear the colours. When I got picked for Western Australia, I wanted to wear the hat. When I got picked for New South Wales and I put the baggy blue on, it, I, I apologise if this sounds, you know, cliched or far-fetched, but when they gave me the cap, and I apologise that I don't have it here with me now because it does mean a lot to me. When I got given that cap, I immediately thought of every other player who had received the cap and who had worn the cap. And of course, then it flows on to the baggy green, which is ridiculous. But, uh, you know. Did you feel ready when you got picked? We're still early in your career when you got picked. Mm. So, as I mentioned, I was 26 when I got picked for New South Wales, 28 when I got picked for Australia. Now, Australia had been playing pretty well. Um, it was the last test in a series against South Africa. And I remember I was playing for North Sydney at the time. I had my club here, North Sydney. I um, were playing at Tremoyne Oval in North Sydney and uh, turned up to the game just as normal. and read the paper, so pre-match ritual, read the paper, have a sandwich, you know, that sort of stuff. And they were talking about possibly picking a second spinner for the Adelaide test, which was to be the last test of the series. And I had a really, really good season for New South Wales, but at no time during that you know, morning, did I think that I would be the guy. Um, there's a guy called David Friedman, left arm wrist spin bowler, who played uh, with me that year. And I, I think he ended up getting uh, 50 wickets uh, for New South Wales that season, which um, in Australia, uh, you know, we played half the games than you, that you do in the, in, in the UK. So it, it's like a 100 wicket season. Uh, so I just thought, oh, wow maybe Freddie's going to get a go. And, you know, that was that. I went out on the field, we played the game, we we're, were, you know, we were bowling. And a guy called Trent Johnson, who ended up playing for Ireland, uh, World Cup, coached New South Wales, still a great mate of mine, fantastic player and coach. He came up to me, um, so I'm bowling, he came up to me at the top of my mark, and I really did not like people talking to me when I was bowling. All right, you know, don't look at me, don't, don't you like, you stay, like, and he came up to me and I was thinking to myself, okay, Stuart, relax. You like Trent. It's okay that he talks to you. He's probably going to come up with some weird fielding suggestion. Just nod politely and let him go. And he said to me, um, 
and apologize if I tear up a little bit here because even though it's a long time ago, it still gives me goosebumps. He said to me, um, oh, hey, mate, what are you doing next weekend? And I said, oh, what are you I'm in the middle of, I'm just about to start of a, what do you mean, what am I doing next weekend? You, you moron, you know. But I liked him, so I was trying to be nice. To him. I said, oh, I don't know. I, you know. He said, well, I mean, you're going to Adelaide, right? I said, why would I go to Adelaide, mate? Uh, you know. He said, well, you know, because you're playing, <laughs> you, you're playing the test match. And I, yeah, I just couldn't believe it. And what had happened is that he'd been down at fine leg and somebody had come up to him and told him and said, McGill's just been picked, <laughs> you know. And so Trent Johnson was the first guy that told me. And then about, so, I said, so then I had to bowl after that. Like, you know, like, you know, I got tears now. Imagine how I was in 1998, you know. And, um, so I'm starting to bowl the over. And at that club ground, they had this loudspeaker. So when the telephone rang, it rang across the whole ground. And so it just started ringing and ringing and ringing. And then all these stupid cars came, like coming, driving down. And I'm telling you, what's going on? I didn't even really understand. And I, I really still to this day, can't believe that it happened like that. And I, after the game, I went home to my house and all the guys in the North Sydney team said, shoot, we've got to celebrate this. You've got to, you, you know, you've got to come out with this. And um, so I went home and I got changed and I went back. And I know it's, it all sounds stupid now, but across the road from the North Sydney Oval, they'd found a, a Scottish bagpipe band. They'd found them who were practicing and they'd said to them, they flipped them a couple of dollars and they said, one of our mates had just been picked for Australia. We want you to go into the pub across the road and when he walks in, we want you to start playing. And they did. And so I had, yeah, it was it was one of the it was one of the most amazing days of my entire life, and um, yeah, I'll never forget it. I, I'm very very lucky, mate. Like at the time, I was Test player number three hundred and seventy four, and that's in it was in over a hundred and twenty years. So I'm a lucky boy. Yeah, you can certainly see what it means to you to have represented Australia. But then if we just go back... They're fake, Neil, they're fake tears. They're fake tears. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to that moment. So you made your debut, and then the series after, it was an India series, but you didn't get picked for that. But then you yeah. got picked for the subsequent one against Pakistan because Shane Warne had a shoulder injury. Mm. You performed great. I was reading about some stats. 15 wickets at 27. Warner's still got a shoulder injury, so you get picked for the Ashes series uh, in 98-99. You're the leading wicket-taker in that series as well. As I said, like, so you're just at the start of your Australian career. At that time, did you feel in your mind that you were the best spinner in the country? Did you feel you were deserving of a spot as number one spinner? Or did that never cross your mind? So, I... I, 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 I... I've got to be very clear about this, and, and it's not being, it's not false modesty. Um, I believe that Shane was a, a far better bowler than me, technically gifted, but mechanically streets ahead of me. But what I always tried to do. I'm a firm believer that you pick your best bowlers. You pick your best four or five bowlers in a test match, you don't lose. Um, I, I also believe that Australia didn't always do that, which meant that I didn't get the opportunity to play with Shane as much as I would have liked 
to. Um, but I always tried to be that next, that next best spinner. Um, and you, and you, look, you can check this out. I, I, I believe that during the period of time from 98 to 2008, when I finished, the Australia in all forms tried 10, 11, 12 or 13 other spin bowlers, um, apart from me. But I never worried about that. All I wanted to be was the second. It's not, it, it wasn't defeatist. I just thought if Shane wants the best Australian spin bowler in history and I'm the second best, when they want another spinner, I'm going to be the guy. And if somebody else got picked, it didn't bother me because I still thought I was the second best. And when I got an opportunity to play, I think the reason that maybe I did do well and better than expected was because I always expected it to be not my first test, but my last test. And so if this is your one opportunity to play for Australia, man, you, you just cash in. Like, just cash in. Because they're the, da they're the, <laughs> they're the days of your lives. They're the, the, it's the moments. It's what amazing. What's the rivalry like with England? Um, a lot has said um, about the Ashes. What did it mean to beat them? We, um, when I was growing up, um, it's funny actually, when I was growing up, as I said, my, my dad's best mate was Dennis Lee. I wanted to be a fast bowler. Dennis was great to me, so I just wanted to be him. And, um, but watching cricket at the time in the 70s and early 80s, the West Indies were pretty red hot. So I wanted to be that. But England versus Australia, the Ashes, all of, I think because of my grandfather and my father, history and tradition and the respect for that is very, very, very important to me. And it still is. And it's something that I talk to my, you know, son and daughter about too. Like, it doesn't matter if you think that the game was different way back then. You got to, the, the, I respect anybody that has put their reputation and ego and emotions on the line to play for their, their country. Australia versus England was what it was all about. And the Ashes was what it was all about. And <laughs> I... The series before I played against England, <laughs> um, I was <laughs> I was hired by the English team to bowl to them and help them prepare to face Shane Warne. Right. And I remember, I think Mickey Mickey Stewart might have been the, the manager, or I think maybe, uh, and that uh, and and you know, I hope I don't get anybody into any trouble here. And it's probably going to be me because I didn't pay tax on it. They they gave me a hundred pounds a day to bowl to them uh, for the two weeks or three weeks they're in Perth prior to the first test match. And um, <laughs> in the first test, Shane got a hat trick. <laughs> so, so I didn't do a great job. But <laughs> but the next series that Australia played against England in Australia. I was playing. Yeah. So guys that I'd been helping by training with them were then were now my opponents. Yeah. So then this the after that test series, it kind of sparked a little bit of in and out of the test side. I know you played against the West Indies, maybe didn't get as many wickets mm. uh, as many expected. And then you kind of go in and out of that test side. But um, before we get into that, you made your ODI debut in 2000, but you only played three matches. Uh, 
He got man of the match yeah. in the first match. Um, what what happened there? It kind of bummed, uh, actually uh, kind of bummed me to be honest. Um, my attitude, uh, regardless of format, so 2020, 50 overs, test match, you know, first class match, my attitude is um, if you're part of the bowling group, um, you, I'm big on strike rate. Like you dismiss the batsman as quickly as you can to provide the guys who know how to handle a bat with as much time and as much opportunity as, as possible. Um, and I, 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 I don't like to talk about it too much, but in 50 over cricket in Australia, I, I knew what I was doing. I, I got plenty of wickets per game, a lot more than anybody else. Um, I loved playing 50 over cricket. I think New South Wales, during the period of time that I was playing, so for 10 years I played, five years we won the 50 over tournament. Um, and, and for me, the reason that I enjoyed playing so much is because the hardest thing for any spin bowler to do is to get the batsman to play a shot. And consequently, the shorter the format, for me, the easier your job is. Uh, because, you know, for instance, in 2020, they're going to play a shot every ball. Um, in 50 over cricket, they, you know, it was much the same at the time. Unfortunately for me, uh, there were some conflicting um, uh, theories. Uh, John Buchanan, um, uh, particularly openly suggested that the reason that, but despite the fact I'd been the leading wicket taker in domestic one day cricket for five or six years, uh, my economy rate was no good. He said it was all about economy rates. That's how you won 50 over games. But ultimately, the guys that were being picked instead of me. We're only going for one one run and over less anyway. Um, but uh, well, my team was winning games. Yeah, so in 2003, was it um, Shane yes. Warne um, felt the drug stress, etc., so got banned for a year. So now you're in the position where you are seen as the number one spinner available. You play 11 test matches. You have 53 right. wickets. What was going through your mind at that time? Did you feel that that inner confidence that you're going to get game in, game out, uh, and just play, play, play a sequence of games that you hadn't before? Look, I, I knew, and 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 once again, some people might find this defeatist uh, or negative, but I I, I don't. I, I knew that when Shane became available. Uh, available again, he would be picked. Uh, this guy is the is the greatest spin bowler in Australian history, possibly world history. You know, he is. You know, he was the best. So I knew that was going to happen. So for those eleven Test matches, I just thought, you know what, uh, I'm going to cash in as much as I can. I'm going to try and make sure that I contribute to a win because that, that was my main goal in every game. It wasn't so much me getting all the wickets. It was I want to take wickets in a team that wins a test match. And so you're contributing all the time. So if you take one wicket in a team that wins a test, that's a good effort. I think that's a good effort. And so that year, all I tried to do was just really put in. I think um, McGrath was actually injured for much of that year as well. And I remember um, Steve Wall, who was the captain at the time. So Disney, uh, Jason Gillespie was 
you know, that became the front running fast bowler, and I was the, the you know the the number one spin ball. And so it was kind of funny because the B team was sort of doing the business, and I don't actually know if I've ever told Dizzy this, but I I was very very proud of what he and I achieved considering we weren't supposed to be the big guns, you know, and um, the trust and respect we got from Steve War during that year um, certainly contributed to our performances and um, it was a great year, but I actually got really tired. <laughs> so, because I'd never, I'd never played that many tests in the year. I was exhausted, and um, at the end, you know, I was kind of glad Shane came back. <laughs> yeah, so in two thousand and four, you get picked together in the uh, the series against Sri Lanka. When you were playing together, did you feel that your role in the side changed, mm. or was it a case of? Um, um, it was just the same or trying to get a wicker with every delivery or did you feel a slight different position? In so so you, uh, you just mentioned then trying to get a wicket with every delivery. Um, this is something that, um, so now um, I spend a lot of time, uh, I don't know if it's coaching, but assisting young spin bowlers uh, uh, who are on the cusp of, you know, maybe first class or international cricket and discussing that particular point, are you trying to get a wicket with every delivery? That's a big thing for me. I believe that you need to identify your best ball. And it's possible and I think recommended that you try and bowl your best ball as often as you can. And the majority of my wickets were taken with my best ball. So it wasn't a wrong or a slide or, a, you know, whatever you want to call it. The majority of my wickets were a leg spin, uh, you know, a, wrist, a leg spinner breaking away from the right-handed batsman or into the left, left-handed batsman. So that's my best ball. So... If that's the case, then why wouldn't I try and bowl that all the time? Um, and so, yeah, I did try and get a wicket every ball. Um, when we went to Sri Lanka and Shane was playing with me, actually my job was easier. Maybe not so easy for him, but I had Shane worn up the other end. I had McGrath up the other end. I had Fleming up the other end. I had Gillespie up the other end. I had Lee up the other end. All these guys, I always felt, you know what? They're the unlucky ones. They got me up the other end. So would it be fair to say that uh, you're kind of a man of great morals? Talking about 2004, Zimbabwe, you chose not to go. Um, There's also, I read up about... um, there was a there was an advertisement with KFC and, and oh, an KFC. with, with uh, Cricket Australia and uh, you know you chose not to take part. Uh, can you talk a little bit about those two incidents? You know what I, I, I can and I but I don't wish to I don't want to overplay them. It, I, it's very flattering that you should say that you know <laughs> a man of high morals I just feel all the time that you've got to have a motive for doing anything that you do and if you can't find one then there's no real reason for you to do it and and if you can't find a motive then you're not going to perform at your best anyway Right, the, you know, uh, with reference to Zimbabwe, I asked a question of the um, 
um, Australian Cricket Management. Sorry, I'm moving around. I'm, I'm, I'm going to plug in. Um, I asked the question of the Australian Cricket Management, how much money was going to be generated by an Australian tour of Zimbabwe? And um, they gave me the number. And I said, do you know where that money is going to go? Because, you know, from TV revenue and ICC contributions. And I said, do you know where the money is going to go? And they went, oh. Uh, and I knew at the time that a number of the players weren't being paid. And um, I developed a friendship with um, Andy Flower, who I still have an enormous amount of respect for. And I spoke to him and asked him what he thought. And he, it was actually, it was sensational advice. He said to me, Stuart, um, if you think you're going to change anything and if you're trying to influence anyone, it, well, you're a dickhead and <laughs> you, 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 you're kidding yourself. Um, nobody will remember tomorrow. But, he said, if you don't feel comfortable about this and you believe that this doesn't work for you, then I respect your decision and I would say thank you. So nothing that I did ever was designed to influence any other player. I didn't, when I pulled out of the Zimbabwe tour, I, I didn't want anybody else to pull out. I was just doing it because it wasn't right. I didn't think it was right. When I, you mentioned the KFC thing, I, I can't understand how any sportsman or woman can advertise fast food. Like the guy sitting on the couch eating his you know, eating his burger. And I mean, I love a burger. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a freak show. I love a burger and, uh, you know, don't mind the occasional fry. But a guy on the TV who trains for six hours a day, seven days a week, advertising fast food to the guy who's sitting on the couch not doing anything six days a week, I just think that's wrong. And I expressed that to my employers. They were very unhappy with me. Um, but ironically, they told me a couple of weeks earlier that I was overweight. <laughs> so <laughs> I just sort of, I just said, so what? So I'm overweight, but you want me to advertise fast food. And I think, uh, you know, your viewers could probably join the dots and uh, imagine what I said. Yeah. So then uh, back on the field, 2005, the, um, the Ashes series that took place in the UK, mm. regarded by, by a lot of people as one of the greatest series of all time. Of all time. You, know, mm. you, you, came, you came over on the touring party but didn't get picked in any of the five test matches. Did that disappoint you? <laughs> Did it disappoint me? <laughs> Now, you're, you're trying to cause trouble. It was actually one of the most disappointing um, experiences of my life. Um, preparation for that series from an Australian point of view was disgraceful. Um, Can you in the, to that in terms of preparation, uh, what went wrong? Oh, uh, I'll, I'll tell you. I mean, no, 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 don't. Uh, but you, you think I'm going to hold something back to you? <laughs> we, um, in the squad that was selected to go on that tour, I think we had seven guys who'd played, uh, including myself, who'd played quite a bit of county cricket. So we knew the bowlers, we knew the conditions, we knew the balls, we knew the approach, we knew what to expect. And I remember uh, it was Simon Kadic. So we had a, a three-day planning meeting uh, just prior to leaving for the, the tour. And 
we were doing uh, Edward de Bono's thinking caps. We didn't talk about Simon Jones. We didn't talk about Andrew Finchoff. We didn't talk about any of the magnificent players who were, you know, in the England setup at the time. We, we, in my opinion, and in a lot of, in hindsight, a lot of players' opinions, we didn't show them any respect at all. Simon Cadditch came up to me after day one of the seven thinking caps and said to me, are we going to talk about any of these players at all? And because of, um, I'll say my reputation, because of my relationship with Buchanan, who I think is one of the most overrated Yeah, look, he, he, he was a passenger with the Australian team for the, the period of time that he was involved. But I had, a, I had a, a poor relationship with him. And I said to Simon, I don't think I'm the best guy for you to talk to about this. Why don't you go and talk to Punter, who was the captain at the time? Ricky Ponting, yeah. And, yeah, Ricky Ponting, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. And he did. Um, I was only playing the test series, not the one day series. The one day series was first. I was working for a, an Australian TV station um, for the one day series. And I'd watched both Jason Gillespie and in this case, Matthew Hayden play and go about their games. And they had changed their approach for whatever reason. Doesn't I, I, I'm not them. I don't know what was in their head. But when I landed in the UK, I went up to John and said to him, been working in media, I've seen this, this and this. Perhaps you should discuss it with the players concerned. A month later, not, not, not a week later, a month later after Australia was, I think, uh, Two one down. I said to John, "Have you have you spoken to these blokes?" They said, "Oh no no no, that, that, that what what you haven't." John Buchanan facilitated an arrogance and disrespect of the conditions and the talent that was. Uh, you know, on show uh, in the England side. Michael Vaughan was amazing um, because of his, he was calm. He was, he, he, I, I still, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a good egg, Michael Vaughan. A lot of time for him, but he was amazing in that series. And none of the young players, and I'll include Freddie and Freddie Flintoff and uh, Kevin Peterson in that, um, none of them would have done anything if it wasn't for Michael Vaughan. And you mentioned your disappointment with John Buchanan. Is there disappointment oh, with uh, Ricky Ponting, the skipper? No, no. Rick, so um, Ricky Ponting, I, played, I was lucky enough to play under a lot of great captains. Um, Ricky Ponting was very, so clearly inspirational in terms of leading by example. So the first year, the first calendar year uh, in which he was captain, he averaged over 100. I think it was 103. So, so he, you know, clearly inspirational. He, I still have a lot of time for him. But one thing I'll say about Rick is once the, the plan had been agreed upon that that was it whereas a guy like Steve Waugh would go well we you know have agreed on this plan uh, but strangely enough this seems to be working let's run with it Rick was very structured um, 
which in a lot of ways is very admirable because you don't want to be sloppy. Um, nobody could ever accuse Ricky of being um, unstructured. He was very highly structured. But I think that the, the blame for that series loss, and, you know, I'm not the, not the first player to say it, I'm not the last player to say it. I'll lay it squarely at the feet of John Buchanan. The 2006-7 Ashes at Australia won 5-0. Um, again, did it? You just didn't get a gig. Uh, that that one didn't that one actually didn't hurt me as much um, because I'm also a fan of you got a winning team and I think you I think it's appropriate for you to um, support players because on any given day not every guy is gonna you know put together a, a, a phenomenal performance. But if your team is winning every week, um, unless things get a little bit risky uh, from time or dodgy from time to time, maybe then you need to change something. But Australia then was dominant, and they did a very, very good job. And then, but then that was Shane Warne's last Test match, the fifth Test match. He retires. You now become the premier spinner in Australia. From a mindset point of view, at that moment, did it change anything? Did you feel, you know, now you don't have the great Shane Warne that will come back into the side? You are the man. Well, look, um, uh, as I said earlier, I, I never, well, I never compared myself to him and I never competed against him because I, I always feel, and I, and I, uh, I feel it's a, it's something that I will say to all young players. You don't compete with anybody in your team. Uh, you contribute to a common goal. Um, when Shane retired, I remember exactly where I, I remember exactly where I was. I was absolutely gobsmacked because he hadn't told me, and I. He hadn't told me. I, I, I didn't. I was shocked. And I remember going at my house, standing outside, on the, and I needed time by myself because obviously I thought of the opportunities that it presented. But you, I mean, you say that. That meant that I was Australia's premier spin bowler. In my mind, having never been Australia's premier spin bowler and knowing that the Australian selectors had tried so many other spin bowlers during my career, I didn't assume anything. And I I thought, okay, so there's... A little bit of a window here, but it's not going to necessarily get any easier. I wonder what's going to happen. And I also knew, see, look, Shane is only a year or 18 months older than me. And I knew what was happening with, you know, physically. Yeah. I, I, I just didn't. I, I did, once again, I'm going to sound like the, the most arrogant bloke on the planet, which uh, is, uh, I, you know, I'm sure I'm going to regret it, Neil, so it's all your fault. Uh, I, I did actually think uh, for a bit there, so I think I had um, 198 test wickets, somewhere around about that at the time. It, 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 it wasn't 200. I hadn't got to 200. I remember thinking when Shane pulled the pin, oh, I'm going to get 400. I, I actually, I thought, I didn't tell anybody, and I'm telling you now, but that's because it's 
so long ago. But but I I did think I thought you know what um this is gonna be this is gonna be cool. And and the reason I thought it was gonna be cool wasn't because I wanted to be better than anyone else or but as I mentioned earlier, I was I'm big I respect history and tradition and opportunity and I knew that not many people got the opportunity that I was being project, presented with. And I I just really, really wanted I really wanted it. And so But then your body you said Yeah. You as die. things unfolded, mate, as things unfolded and I I you, you can't complain because every there's always somebody else who's I was like Right. I stood in the sun for for a job. It's it's like you can't complain. But oh my goodness, I I never played a test match in India. I never played a test match in South Africa. I never played a test match in England. I never played a test match against New Zealand. In the twelve months following my unfortunate demise. I'd have done all of that. And and not only that, my family's Welsh. And the first test of that Ashes series was was at the Fire Gardens. Yeah. And I man, I I gotta tell you <laughs> I think about it not all day every day, but there's there's, there's a couple of hours every day. <laughs> so how important was that relationship with the wicket keeper? You put in the Australian side, Ian Healy and Adam Gilchrist as a spinner. How important is that relationship? You watch. Um, there's on YouTube. There's this video of Brad Haddon in one of one of his first games for New South Wales. I think we're playing against um, South Africa, and he he was taking stumpings and catches down leg side off bad balls that I was bowling. And it was a gift to me, but what an amazing contribution he was making to the team, but also my career. Chris Reed, who played uh, with at Knotts with me, what a mate! He is possibly I'll go Ian Healy, Pete Neville, Chris Reed. And then had some gilly. But Chris Reid, in the first year I played at Knotts, I, I think he took three catches down leg side. It, it's borderline impossible. Um, the wicket keeper is the guy who reminds a spin bowler that the sun will come up tomorrow. And then the greatest captain that you played under during your career? So uh, captaincy is all about um, captaincy is all about a time and a place. Um, when I first started playing Test cricket, I needed I needed Mark Taylor because he was like um, school headmaster, held my hand, told me what to do told me when to do it. If I did it at the wrong time, smack on the hand. He like he, he did it perfectly. When he retired, um, after that that 98-99 Ashes series, I was actually uh, pretty upset because I felt that firstly he could keep going, but secondly, he was vital to my performance. But it was gone and it was done. As it turned out, Steve War was, he was just everything that I ever needed. He and I don't have a lot in common. Apart from having played for Australia, we, we're from different, different parts of the world. We have different interests. He has rubbish taste in music and I'm obviously very cool. 
Um, but he was my guy. And to this day, if I want to talk to somebody or ask them a, a, a serious question about cricket, Steve Bloor or Simon Kadic, they're, 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 they recognise differences in their teammates but appreciate the common goal. Speaking to you in the UK, um, Trevor Bayliss, who you know uh, very well, I played under him as captain a couple of times, uh, New South Wales, second eleven. He also, I, I was not surprised when it turned out he was a great coach because he was a great captain as well. And uh, I know you touched on it earlier that you do a little bit of consultation work with some spinners. Do you actually, is there any desire of yours to get back into the game full time and go into coaching and a word on the up and coming leg spinners around the world, their talent there? Look, I, I, um, I never thought that I would enjoy coaching. It was never something that was on my to-do list. Um, but I know how difficult it is. Basically, we, we both slow. Your grandma could hit me for six. Um, I know what you're going through when you stand at the top of your mark and you're looking down at the batsman. I love, I, I actually, I, I love it. I love having the opportunity to save people from feeling bad about that. Just because your grandma hit you for six doesn't mean you can't get her out the next ball. Um, I've been very, very lucky. The ECB's looked after me phenomenally. Um, you know, uh, Peter Sarch, Andy Flower, Trevor Bayliss, um, uh, and, you know, Strauss. They, 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 they looked after me very, very well. And every year, a couple of blokes... Uh, would come down and uh, play great cricket in, in Sydney. Um, you know, Mason Crane was the first overseas player to play for New South Wales since 1983. Uh, Imran Khan. Oh, the first one. Yeah. But, but that is in, like, if Mason, if Mason never plays another test match, is the first international player since 1983 to play for New South Wales. It's a, it's a huge achievement. And I've already told you what it meant to me to put the blue cap on. <laughs> huge achievement. Yeah. I think he got 70 wickets in all forms for his uh, great club, Gordon, in that year. Amazing. I've had Parkin from Lancashire down here Josh Poison, one of the great folks, and I, I've got to say, I believe he'll be one of the great spin bowling coaches in the UK, ultimately. Um, his career's not finished yet, but when he, he's going to be a great coach, uh, uh, Dobby. Um, but my guy that I really love at the moment Matt, is Matt Critchley. Um, he's at Derby. Probably, yeah. I think he's made three first class uh, hundreds already. But this dude, six foot two, he can bowl. He's obviously not as well as me, but <laughs> and I'm only saying that so that he can hear it. But <laughs> but um, he, I can see him slotting into an international side because of what he can do with the bat and his hands. And the ball is a he's a very very solid player and and the fact that I've had the chance to spend time with these young and I, I call them young blokes because I'm 15 now but um, 
don't feel I've had the chance to spend time with these young blokes. It, may, it actually makes me feel pretty good. So I love it. Every single time any of them has a good day, it makes me feel good. So, uh, yes, I am. Look, yeah, I'm, yeah, it might be a bit warm and fuzzy, but I'm very happy. <laughs> Perfect. Stuart, um, fantastic insight into your career. Thank you for being so open and honest with, with everything. And uh, all the best with the restaurant. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Hey, Neil, you know what? Think, you know how I said I, I'm grateful for everything that's happened to me? How lucky am I to be talking to you? No, no. I'm the lucky man. <laughs> I'm the lucky man. No, appreciate your time. Have a, have, a, have a wonderful week, mate, and I, and I hope you, uh, you stay happy and healthy. Speak soon. So Neil Kagram, Cricket Astros, Stuart McGill. Thank you.